Thank you for everybody for joining us. My name is Rai, I use she, they pronouns. I'm part of the community team here at Plume. I'm super, super excited to be kicking off our All About You week with our community collaborative panel. I will be joined by Courtney, Ray, and Josh to talk about spilling the E. Wanted to make sure that uh, it's very clear that this is not a medical conversation. We are all folks, including me, who have experience with taking estrogen and uh, uh, HRT and are here to share experiences. So what works for somebody might not work for everybody. And uh, whatever we share comes from our, our own personal experiences. I wanted to open the floor over to our lovely community collaborators too. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh. I use they, them, or he, him pronouns. I'm uh, trans non-binary. Um, I'm actually just on three months of gender-affirming hormone therapy with estrogen. Um, I'm loving the changes I'm seeing. And um, a non-HRT-related thing that's giving me gender euphoria, because HRT is giving me gender euphoria, um, but non-gender, uh, non-HRT-related is um, I recently delved into the world of Botox and got a lip flip to make my upper lip just a little bit fuller and, um, loving the results from that. It has me questioning whether I will continue to get lip flips, or I'm also starting to consider whether a dermal filler, cause it just lasts a little longer is something I want. Um, that's a, a physical thing that's giving me gender euphoria. Um, a non-physical thing that's been giving me gender euphoria is finding stores that are inclusive in their sizing and offering things to lots of folks. That always, hands down, um, makes me feel really happy in my skin when I feel like I belong at a place that I'm shopping. I guess I can go next. Um, hi, my name is Ray. I go by Sheila. Uh, I've been transitioning since I was 16. I actually took my first dose of estrogen when I was 17. It's actually a funny story because I couldn't get it. And then I actually took my friend's birth control just to get a little bit of estrogen. Um, and I think like one thing that gives me gender euphoria that I've navigated since transitioning for so long is that I finally feel so euphoric looking at myself in the mirror naked. Like, I know it's like a little weird, but I just feel so happy to see my body aligning with how I feel on my inside. That's actually so nice. Um, my name is Courtney. I go by she, her. Um, I transitioned, um, I came out as trans at 24 and I think started hormone therapy at 25. I'm now turning 30, which doesn't make me feel euphoric at all. But um, something that's making me feel euphoric lately. Um, I think I actually had someone reach out to my social media manager about doing a collaboration. Um, and they're doing something similar that I wanted to do with my company where they're coming out with basically like a trans specialty line. And the whole business is gonna be focused towards trans people. Um, and I think just seeing the movement of, people that are now not living in stealth and being fearful and they're just like being open and so excited to embrace what trans means to them just makes me feel really really hopeful and excited about the world around me back to you <laughs> <laughs> thank you so lovely uh so glad i get to be in a little space with all of y'all i may be hopping in and out i'm mostly just doing moderating but uh, yeah, I have also been on estrogen for the past year and a half. I used to identify as non-binary, you say them pronouns. I came out when I was 16, but I didn't start to really come into my transness, like as a trans femme person until recently over the pandemic, um, which is a, a question that I want to pass over to you, actually, to all of you. Uh, I want to know, like, how has the pandemic impacted the way that you, like, you process your gender or even just like how you felt safe or comfortable in your body? And yeah, that's a question for everybody. Um, I start because I feel like it's not so much anything that was gender affirming per se, but I did start progesterone um, during the pandemic. And the reason being was I went to go and have a breast augmentation. I'm from Canada. So here, 
if you develop under a certain amount in your transition, your breast augmentation is covered. And unfortunately, mine was not. So my doctor had told me that progesterone was something that can help with breast growth as well. Um, so I started that through the pandemic by myself and it did, it worked. Um, I think it's something that everyone should do research on. It's not going to be for everybody, but through the process of like gaining my COVID weight, I also gained like some COVID boobs that I was really excited about. So I think that was probably like the most positive thing, but I also lived by myself. I was single during the pandemic and during lockdown. Um, so as much as it's safe and it's nice, it was definitely pandemic loneliness. I have two dogs, thankfully, but um, I'll pass that off to one of you. Sorry, I guess I can go next. Um, so the pandemic definitely changed my perspective with, uh, I guess, like womanhood for me, because for me, I was kind of pushed to be hyper feminine at, from like an early age. Like my family was very much assimilate, 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 because I come from a mixed household. Um, so instead of labeling myself as like a trans woman, now I just go by a trans femme because I actually don't mind uh, being perceived as like more androgynous or more masculine. Like I'm actually very welcoming of that because I guess I never realized that I, I guess I just didn't have a chance to explore that. So now that I'm more comfortable with myself and I'm older, now I'm like, hmm, maybe I actually don't mind being more androgynous. And I think with my style and stuff like that, I'm probably leaning into that more now. I think the pandemic changed the way of you, my gender a lot. You know, I knew that non-binary was a word that felt right for me for a really long time. Um, using the word trans is relatively more recent, like during the pandemic. Um, although I didn't, I also didn't use non-binary for me until about the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I think a lot of that is tied up to the fact that I'm an elementary school teacher. Um, and even in New York City, um, where, you know, the perception is that school is super, super affirming spaces for queer people and teachers. It's really not the case. Um, there's a lot of homophobia, queerphobia, and transphobia all throughout the city's schools, and there's a lot of gendering. And so um, I think what took me so long to start using, you know, non-binary and trans for myself is tied to the fact that I was afraid of the implications that would come with being out at work. And, um, you know, I was out as a, as a gay man at work, you know, and everyone knew that, but um, there's a lot of privilege and sort of like mainstream acceptance, uh, acceptance of that in some ways. Um, not saying it's a safe space for all, all gay men whatsoever, but, um, you know, that's a different label and it has different connotations. And so, you know, I've, I've been a queer teacher for pretty much as long as I've been a teacher, but um, I never, I, I, I was afraid of what, you know, saying I'm non-binary, I'm trans meant for me at school. And, and quite honestly, I'm still um, in some ways very much in the closet at work in that regard, just because of staff and and the community um i will say you know for the past five or six years you know i've been showing up to school with my cute jumpsuits and uh nails are always done but um you know people just think i'm i, I think a lot of people just read me as an effeminate man um but being at home over the pandemic and teaching remotely and and working remotely um, you know, really allowed me to start wearing a t-shirt dress to work every day on Zoom or allowed me to um, just explore in ways that were private because I was at home, um, but also sort of public because, you know, you could see me from here up, by the way, this is a dress. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, there, there's a comfort um, and, and if I was going to give anyone advice about, you know, that process of, of transitioning, of, of starting to think about your clothes or your presentation differently, it's one, um, 
order stuff online because you can try it home, try it on in the safety of your home. Um, most places will offer free returns these days, right? They're just hungry for orders and they <laughs> sort of don't care if you end up not liking it or it doesn't fit and you send it back with a free return. And it gives you that safety net of not doing something in public yet. And so I think that um, as awful as the pandemic has been, that, you know, there are positive consequences of it. And one of it is that it, it does offer gender expansive people a lot of safety. Yeah, I also wanted to highlight that we also, yes, thank you for everybody in the chat, just sharing all of your vulnerability too, as everybody has been speaking. We just got a question in the chat too. Um, this is from Olivia. They had asked, how do you deal with bad dysphoric days? And any tips to help with that? Um, I can speak somewhat to that because I've found recently, like especially in the last six months, for some reason, I've had more dysphoric days than I have probably like in the last two or three years. Um, I can't like exactly put like a hand on it. There's just some things that I've begun to notice. And I think for me, when I transitioned, I'm six foot one, by the way, so I'm quite tall. Um, and I wasn't a feminine, I'd come out as gay when I was 15 years old and was in relationships with men throughout my life. Um, but I was never classified as like a feminine gay. Um, and I think that was just because I had suppressed who I was so deeply that I was terrified. So when I first transitioned to say like I was going through an awkward phase would be to put it lightly. Um, and I just felt like I had to do it and put it out there and like have a full face of makeup and wear what I wanted to wear and just go walk down the street. And if people stared at me, like it was an experience I needed to do in order to put a level of confidence in myself. Um, and I would wear like six inch heels and be six foot five and just a very awkward looking woman that was kind of coming into her own. Um, but now for some reason, it's just little things that I'm noticing. I've never had any cosmetic surgery. I haven't had Botox yet, but I'm really excited to get my first set of Botox done and get my lips done for the first time soon. But I'm thinking about facial feminization surgery and there's little things that you start to pick apart in yourself, which is like, I find that my brow bone structure is masculine and I don't love that. And like my height has always been something that I've, worked hard to get over but I think like my best tip is just be patient because if I look at myself today and a photo of myself three years ago I'm not going to feel half as much dysphoria as I would have back then but back then I was so confident because I had to be that person to go up against the world and be there so as long as you can offer yourself the patience to like validate the moment accept that it's a feeling, but that it's a temporary feeling because there is a lot of forms of resolution now that we have, thankfully. But even if it's not, it's not something that you need to feel ashamed of. I think if we learn to embrace what makes us trans a bit more and have like a hyper positivity towards things that make us different and unique, like my brow bone and being six foot one and being this tall goddess and just learning to accept what we're looking at ourselves as a flaw because it doesn't stereotypically fall into the category of the gender that you identify as, but accept that it's that uniqueness that makes us so beautiful and such amazing individuals in our own moments. But I'll pass it off to one of you as well. I'd love to just add on to what you were saying, Courtney. Um, I think one, there's no shame and days that you do experience dysphoria. It's a totally normal feeling. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, just like feeling happy and sad, it's an ebb and flow, right? You know, it's totally human to, and, and not, and, and while gender euphoria and dysphoria are, are, you know, I think trans specific feelings, although not necessarily. There is, there is an ebb and flow to it. And I just feel like it's a totally normal thing. And they think, so one of the things is like, 
acknowledging it and talking about it, right? There's no, you said there's no shame, Courtney. And I feel the same, like there's no shame. Some days you don't feel super great in your body. Um, and so I have talked about this on my own social media quite a lot before, but as icky and sort of vulnerable as it sounds, one of the things that I do every day is I take a photo of myself every day. Um, in clothes, not in clothes, you know, you, you decide that, you know, if, if you're going to take the, up this practice, you decide what you feel comfortable doing. But the reason I love doing that is I see the way that my body looks and changes over time. And um, if I'm having a particularly dysphoric day or I'm having a day where I don't feel great in my body, I know that I have lots of pictures of myself that I can go and find a place where I was feeling euphoric and, and remember and recall what that day and moment felt like. Um, and even on the days where I do feel great, I think it's also an opportunity because you're experiencing sort of that gender euphoria to look back at the days that weren't feeling so good and to sort of like look at yourself and think about why, just like you were sharing, Courtney, like your height or your brows I, I same here um and um dissect that and like try and think like what are the antecedents that are causing this dysphoria for me and are there actions I can take or is there a beauty to this that I'm you know I've internalized some bullshit about that I need to unlearn um I just find that taking photos of myself clothed in makeup, not in makeup, nude, whatever, are, are very helpful sort of as like a, a, a journal. Mm, so I guess what I would say is like the picture thing is actually a really good uh, thing that you do, Josh, because I actually like look at old photos of myself and I'm like, holy shit, like I look so amazing in this photo, like, like low-key obsessed with myself. And when I have those days where I feel like super dysphoric, I look back on those photos and I'm like, this time will pass. It's more about like how you feel like confident in the moment and emotions are temporary. You just have to keep reminding yourself and you're on a journey that takes a long time to be like totally comfortable with yourself, bring that Zen that you need inside. And it's funny because I, I think in 2020, I was actually thinking about getting FFS like on my brow bone area. And I was like obsessed with like, aesthetics and like making myself like look like this perfect person that I wanted but after I like realized I like looked at my my brow bone and I was like this is like an this is like a Filipino feature that my family has and I started embracing that more instead of like nitpicking and wanting to like make things better but I think you're just gonna have good or bad days and you just have to realize that you guys the comfortability has to come from inside of you and I guess that's all I have to say about that. I'll just hop in for a second because I see a lot of people in the chat talking about taking selfies. Um, I just want to put in there, you can also use a self-timer so that you're not straining your arm or your neck, right? Use that self-timer and get get the full glam, get the full photo without, without the arm outstretch holding yourself. Just soak up your body. Um, you don't have to strain your neck or your arm to take a photo. Speaking of photos too, I learned that you can take like, if you go on Instagram and you do the the self timer thing, you can record a video <laughs> and, and then just screenshot the video itself as pictures. I noticed that sometimes doing that is really helpful um, in terms of just like skipping through like the different looks and different angles and stuff. And also just wanted to talk a little bit about like photo journaling too. Like I think it's photo journaling is so like of yourself is so fascinating because I think dysphoria, at least the way that I kind of process it, there's like, there's, there's so many layers to it. There's like the social dysphoria, but there's also like the self-perception dysphoria. I think that oftentimes when I'm experiencing a lot of dysphoria, nothing has really changed from the moment where I experience euphoria from the moment to I, I'm experiencing dysphoria, nothing in between has really changed except for my own perception of it. And so sometimes if I'm feeling really, really down about myself and I end up taking a photo and then maybe like three months later, I look back at it, I'm like, huh, what, what was I so worried about? 
like what was I so scared about what was I so nitpicky or or obsessed about in terms of the way that I look the way that I'm being perceived etc I think that um kind of like this this function of like the ever evolving the the ever shedding of like our transness and coming into the fullness of ourselves is kind of like a hyper awareness of like where we want to be or where we think we should be uh in terms of like oh our like facial features or the way that we dress or the way that we present but I think that uh there's already so much beauty that we have in us like as is uh sometimes it's just hard for us to see that in the moment um so I hope that for folks in the chat too like you can be patient with yourselves too and if I could just before we wrap it up I think like at the beginning of a journey for anyone that's just beginning this or if they're watching this um and just kind of doing some self-discovery transitioning is like a metamorphosis that is ever growing within yourself you're constantly going to become you know as a human being people are just forever changing we're learning we're growing if you're not then you're stuck and you know we want to be learning and growing as people it's the same thing with your transition things that I really thought were important that I love so much when I first transitioned really aren't relevant to me anymore and they don't make me feel any more feminine or confirm what I am to myself now. And I think going inward and just being patient with your transition and through the journey, I actually just pulled up an old photo that I'm just gonna show you guys quickly of myself so that you have like an idea of a journey. But I was definitely like, looking at this now, like, I don't actually look at old photos. It's almost like looking at like a twin brother I never had, but those moments of a photo journey, when you can look at where you started and then now look at where you are, I think are just really helpful reminders that your whole transition is beautiful. No matter what part of it you're in, they all lead to the future you, which is you being confident with yourself and having self-acceptance and self-love and no matter where you're at in that journey, it's positive. So just be patient because it can seem like a rush to get there at the time. And I remember that feeling. And I think there's, if you can find the beauty in, in those steps rather than rushing through them, I think it just makes the transition when you look back a little bit more enjoyable. And I wish I had slowed down sometimes to enjoy some of those moments a little bit more. And enjoy like the androgynous parts because I you get to live them once. So <laughs> soak them in. Yeah, speaking about taking time and everything, we actually just got a question from the chat. And I kind of wanted to make this like a two-part question almost. Um, the first one was, did you have any hesitations about taking HRT? And if so, what ultimately tipped the scales for you? And uh, kind of adding on to that, uh, how did you, how did you navigate like the possible change, knowing that your body was going to change? How did you navigate that experience, knowing that it might be unpredictable? You're not sure what's going to happen, and you may or may not be disappointed because it's kind of your first time doing something like this. Um, if you need clarification, please let me know. That was two part question. <laughs> Okay, I'll hop on. I feel like we've got like a little routine here where I answer and then Josh answers. <laughs> we just keep going through. So we'll keep up the trend. Um, but I think everyone's nervous when you're making a decision that's going to change your body. Of course, it's a bit intimidating at the moment. You want to feel sure that your decision is going to be something that you're going to be happy with in the future. And I don't think I ever doubted that I would be happy after I transitioned. But in the moment where you're deciding, is this for me? There's, I think, just a lot of what ifs that kind of go through your mind. I didn't expect hormone therapy to react so well with my body. Um, I was like a stick. I was like 150 pounds soaking wet. Um, so my doctor was like, you probably won't have very much breast growth. You don't really have any fat to redistribute along your body. So like, basically you're gonna be a lamppost, which I was fine with, but eventually the thing that tipped me over was 
I was so stuck in my feeling of confusion and anger within myself. And my anger would be displaced in ways that I never even meant it to be and towards people I never meant it to be. And it was just because I had such an inner battle going on that I didn't know how to recognize and talk about and I didn't have the language to try and express the way I was feeling. And within the first week of starting my hormone replacement therapy, it was the first time in my life where I felt like my mind, my body and my soul could all communicate and I made sense to myself. And all of a sudden this like inner turmoil that was leaking out of me constantly just stopped and there was like resolution within myself to just feel happy like I just felt inner happiness but I'll pass that off to Josh yeah I mean I'm just on my third month so I started recently um it was something I took an enormous amount of time to think about and decide to do for lots of reasons um I think one of the things that kept me from doing it for so long was a lot of internalized transphobia that I had to reflect on, sit with and unlearn. Um, and being in community with other trans folks in real life and on social media and, and, and sitting back and listening to and observing their lived experiences was tremendously helpful. Um, I think so that's one thing that, you know, it, it took me some time to arrive at the decision to start estrogen. Um, the other thing is, again, this is not a medical discussion whatsoever, but, you know, there are a few risks associated with it. Um, particularly for me, I am just a huge hypochondriac about heart disease because it is something that has affected my family a lot. Um, and so for a long time, I, I kept all of those thoughts to myself instead of seeking a clinician, a doctor to talk to and actually learn more about. Um, so I don't recommend doing that. I think if there, I think my point here is if there are, if you see some of the health risks and they're causing you pause, talk to someone about those health risks, because I think that you'll be assured that the risk is relatively low. Um, and there are lots of different routes and methods for taking estrogen. Um, so that was, that was another thing. And then for me, I, I was less concerned about like the permanent changes that it, you know, could cause. And if I would, you know, be upset about them, I, I think the tipping point for me is I realized that um, well, let me back up for a second. First, I am a person who arrived at realizing I wasn't a cisgender man by experiencing moments of euphoria instead of dysphoria. So I started using the word non-binary because I realized that the moments I felt like my best self were moments where I was not feeling like a man. And um, on top of that, I, I only started to start having those feelings of dysphoria after I settled into the things that were bringing me euphoria and realized that there were some things that were sort of not feeling great. Um, so for me, the tipping point was, and I just heard the term flesh vessel um, from someone on social media recently to, you know, to refer to your body. And so for me recent, uh, or, you know, a few months ago, when I finally decided to make the decision, it was like, well, this is my flesh vessel. And there are some things I'm not loving. And I had been reading up on HRT for a while and considering it. And, um, you know, it's like, do I want to go into these feelings of depression? Do I want to continue to feel like I'm repressing something or not making a choice that I feel like will make my life better? Um, so ultimately it was like, well, why not? Like, I, I think this is something I want. Um, 
And it's been a great decision. You know, I, like Courtney shared almost instantly after starting it, I felt very satisfied with the decision, even though I, you know, very early on, I didn't see a lot of changes, but even three months in, um, I'm noticing a lot of things that feel really great for me. And I, I have no regrets. So I guess the only hesitation that I had to like start was um, socially with my family. So I started when like back in 2008. So I lived in a really small town and there wasn't really any resources for that type of stuff. So I was basically like in the dark because my family wouldn't take me to like counseling and stuff. So I think the hardest part was for me was finding things that helped me. And the biggest hesitation was like trying to like find a way to like actually do it Um, because I was all in as soon as I heard the word trans as a teenager I like hyper fixated on it and I just made that everything that I wanted because it made sense. Um, And I guess like body body issue or changes, particularly like the only thing I can think of and it's kind of like something that. I'm experiencing now as I've kind of realized that I don't really want to be like this subject of what my family wanted me to be is I actually get dysphoria from kind of having breasts now because I never really wanted to have boobs. Um, I just kind of wanted to look like a really hot (laughs) androgynous person. So that's kind of the only issue that I have now because everything else I kind of get super euphoric about like my hair is like just amazing now too. Like my skin is the way I want it to be. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I'll just add on that again, like centering positive consequences. I think that what led me to the tipping tipping point was I wanted my skin to look amazing. And I knew that estrogen would help sort of soften and, and get that glow. Um, again, I've also been doing Botox and I just recently started a skincare routine that I'm like two months into. So it's a combination. Um, but the other, again, centering the positive is I, I, I like you didn't really care about breast development, but I'll just add on, um, also being fat, I sort of already had boobs anyway. And so I was like, eh, if they grow a little bit, like whatever, you know, they're already like, here and out so it's fine you know like it it, and 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 honestly that was part of the decision making because I knew that it could cause a little bit of development but I was like I really want softer skin I really want eventually over a long time to soften and reduce the grow of facial hair and so it was like I've already got tits anyway if they grow a little and I can get better skin and have a little bit of a softer and and feminized look all over like sign me up Yes, the softer phase. <laughs> Love that. Sorry, Alex, you're on tea. You don't get this. You don't get the clean skin, unfortunately, but we do. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of speaking around, you know, like things around body changes, skin. Uh, these are kind of more like, oh, like the, the changes that happen as a result of being on HRT. Somebody had asked about like, how did you learn about makeup and hairstyles like what was that process like um and also you know if you have any kind of hair hairstylists or makeup artists that you follow on Instagram or YouTube like could you share those resources too so I guess I'll start because I own a makeup company (laughs) um so I had literally I think picked up a makeup brush once when I was 14 um from like a friend's makeup bag while they were out to like look in a mirror and be like would I be pretty and clearly had no idea how to use it or what was happening and was the answer was no um and that scared me back into my little trans shell as it was because I was it was a terrifying experience for me so when I transitioned I knew absolutely nothing so I actually went to Sephora and was like basically help like here's my credit card just rack it up and tell me what to do um and then I spent I mean honestly probably like 12 days straight just on YouTube watching tutorials and watching trans people that had feminization tips and watching 
like how to do certain makeup styles that looked with good with my face and my face structure and, and what your eye shape is and how to do things. And honestly, makeup is almost like its own transition state, in my opinion, because my journey with makeup, it has helped me so much throughout my life and given me such gender confirmation within myself. I'd almost been like a bit of a an armor when I go outside to give me that confidence boost. Um, and I think that it, it's different for everyone. So like for myself, I obviously wear like a very full face of makeup. I have lashes on. This is like basically my everyday face. Um, and there, that's not for everybody. And it doesn't make you more feminine to wear more makeup. It doesn't make you more feminine to have less body hair or facial hair. It doesn't make you any less of a woman um, if you have long hair or short hair. I think we fall into these categories and makeup gets placed in one of you'll be more feminine if, if you wear makeup, if you have this. So my relationship with makeup wasn't extremely healthy to start off with. Um, I think because I just related it so much to being feminine. And I think I've tried to maybe still working on it, but adjust my relationship with that. And that's why I think starting this company and trying to have such a focus on inclusion and what it means for women, I wanted to create products that weren't just things that I like. So I like a full coverage foundation that makes it look like I have a brand new set of skin on my face. Some women just want something that's moisturizing and tinted. And my journey learning about what makes people beautiful, what they find beautiful in the confidence is you're not going to be beautiful to everybody, no matter how you do your face, no matter what you're wearing, no matter how long your hair is, it doesn't matter because everyone sees beauty in a different light. And at the end of the day, as long as you are seeing yourself as beautiful, the people that you want in your circle and the people that you will have the best interaction, in my opinion, as a trans person are people that find you beautiful, no matter what that is. So don't try and relate too much to what makeup or what hairstyles or what it is that's going to be part of your transition. Just focus on what makes you feel beautiful um, and what that looks like for you. And be patient too. Makeup, if you saw the first couple of attempts, um, it was a horrible train wreck and that had a Snapchat filter on it, which <laughs> shows that it is patience. But everything's a journey. Just try and have fun with it. I think a lot of people, when we transition, we take everything so seriously. And, you know, I wasn't doing makeup well. And it was just such a like, you know, I'm not great at being a girl, even though I am a girl. Like, why can't I do this? Whereas if we just learn to like laugh with ourselves a little bit more and respect the awkwardness that can be us sometimes and the awkwardness that makes us so beautiful and vulnerable and fun. Um, if we can learn to just like laugh with ourselves rather than have like such anxiety and like almost self, not like self worth issues, but self anger when things aren't going right to just like give it a minute and laugh about it and get through our day, I think it would bring a lot more positivity and like mental happiness in those awkward phases where you do feel uncomfortable because they're going to be there. There's no way to avoid them. So try to like make it a goofy fun experience rather than like a nitpicking negative one, if that makes sense. But I'll pass that off. So I guess I'll go. Um, I'm not particularly sure how I started getting into like hair and makeup. I think I started like watching at my mom when she was doing it all the time. Um, but I would just watch like video after video after video. And then I think the easiest way is just like practicing on yourself. Cause I just started like doing my own personal like styling now. Cause like I used to always like go to makeup artists and like go to hairstylists and have them do my hair and makeup for me because I just didn't know what I was doing. But I like started hyper fixating on how to do my own hair and how to do my own makeup. And I guess like your style will always be evolving as well too. Um, 
hot. Sorry, I'm like a little hot. Um, but I think like the best way is like finding like a friend who can like show you how to do makeup and show you how to do hair. Cause uh, my friend is actually a, uh, she's a hairstylist and she studied cosmetology in school. So like my biggest resource was actually her teaching me how to do things. Cause I'm not very good at learning on my own. So I guess like having a friend that can be really patient with you, help you figure out your style and just help you along your journey, I guess. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge that I think there's such an enormous amount of weird cultural gatekeeping around makeup and learning it and knowing what to put on your face, right? As someone who was um, raised as a boy or a man, you know, obviously I did not learn how to shop for or apply makeup as a kid. And so it's something I learned once I started playing with my gender. Um, but even places like Sephora and Ulta where you go buy makeup felt really scary places to go when I didn't know what I was doing. And I'll just go back to my tip with clothes, which I think is at the very beginning, if you're feeling super uncomfortable, shop online and order things, samples if you can, or a, a singular lip or eye product to just play with and see how it feels. Um, but I would say my entry into thinking about makeup was definitely around eyes. I adore like eye makeup and eyeshadow and that's sort of where I begin playing. Um, I'm not a super full coverage makeup person. Um, I tend to just go for some eyeshadow or my, I, I tend to do a winged eyeliner a lot with some mascara. Um, recently I have, not started applying foundation, but I'm really into like color correcting cream or tinted moisturizer, just that like helped sort of like brighten up my face a little bit. Um, and I'm very into lipstick. So for me, I'm not a full coverage person. I tend to play with my eyes and lips a lot. And, you know, I'll do like primer and like a blur stick or a color correcting cream elsewhere. Um, but like everyone has shared, I think I used to feel frustrated by it um, when I feel like I didn't know what I was doing. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what, like, there's not a right way to do makeup. You know, like, if you feel like you look hot, sexy, cute, if it makes you feel good, then you've applied makeup the right way. Right. Um, and sort of probably what's a less existential tip and more practical is it also helps to have the right brushes. So if you are into um, eye makeup, then you should order yourself a little like starter kit of eye brushes to um, play with and, and help you blend and get things on your eyes where you want them. Um, and you'll learn how to use those brushes by YouTube, and watching other folks on social media and TikTok. I did just see a comment that I just wanted to quickly um, touch on. Um, I saw somebody talk about using drugstore makeup when you're first starting off. And I do support that because makeup A, is expensive. And when you're learning how to do it, you go through a ton. But with that being said, when you're using a drugstore brand, majority of them are not as workable just because they're not as high of quality and they have a lot more um, like fillers and just the blendability of a lot of foundation products from a drugstore are garbage. So if you do go to a drugstore, um, getting like eyeliner and mascaras and, and eyeshadows and products that are workable are really easy. If you're using a foundation from a drugstore to practice with, just keep in mind that the quality of foundation is going to lack. And especially if you're early in your transition and you have facial hair like I did and you're trying to cover that with that foundation, it's probably not going to have the coverage that you need and it's not going to have the buildability in the foundation formula for you to keep applying it. It'll just end up kicking on. So maybe just apply everything else drugstore brand and focus on complexion um with something that's just a little bit of a step up even if it's still drugstore just don't go for 
what's that mousse that everyone in high school used to use where it's like one shade of complete orange it was like a l'oreal color match that didn't color match anyone in their entire life but um yeah just try and find something that's a little bit better for your complexion and better for your skin too just because when you transition your skin goes through a huge change um and you want to make sure that you're still giving your skin the vitamins and nutrients that it needs and not just loading it up with product um because that can have a negative effect as well and kind of riffing off a little bit about um the process of makeup too i was, just, I was we were getting a couple comments and some questions around things around like facial hair and everything. And of course, facial hair is never like a sink to fire or, or you know, not everybody has to uh, have one type of relationship with their facial hair. So wanted to open up with the rest of you too, to get rid of or not to get rid of facial hair. How do you like to clean up slash how do you like to embrace it? I have an interesting relationship with body hair. I really feel dysphoric about it on my face. And I think that part of that is because I've never had like a solid beard mustache. It's very patchy. It is a weird color that doesn't match my hair or any other hair on my body. It's like sort of orangey and yellow. It just like feels like it arrived on my face from outer space. And so because it's patchy and this weird color that just doesn't feel like it goes with anything. And for the fact that I do wear makeup sometimes, not that you can't wear makeup and have facial hair, of course, but I, I want it gone. And I'm actually looking into getting laser hair removal. Um, I'm trying to leverage my social media to help me offset the costs of it. So look for a little sponsorship with some laser hair, laser hair removal, got a couple leads. We'll see. Um, the other thing though, with that is body hair everywhere else on my body causes me no dysphoria whatsoever. Armpit hair, leg hair, little happy trail. I am, I'm fine with it. And, and, and again, that's because, you know, body hair and how you feel about it is super personal. So I, I think that's like the biggest thing to remember is that, you know, like feel your feels about how you feel about your body hair and acknowledge that somebody else is going to have a totally different experience. So for me, I think I related it early on to no body hair meant being more feminine. Um, and I think I've just realized that I, I'm lucky. I consider myself lucky that I didn't have a ton of facial hair that I was going through just because I don't want it on my face. So I consider myself lucky for my own journey, just because if I had had quite a bit more, it would have been a much harder journey for me. And I have a good skin type that laser works on. Um, so that being said, like, basically when I'm old, I want to look like a naked mole rat. Like I just want like not a single piece of hair left on my body when I'm a corpse. So I actually, I did the same thing. I used my social media as leverage um, and had a couple opportunities and found a spa that I felt really comfortable with. Um, and she's literally the loveliest person ever. And I go... I mean, I don't really have any anymore, but I was going at the beginning probably once every three weeks or once a month. Um, and it took about, I would say five or six treatments to really see like the full effects of not having any regrowth for a period of time. But there's still times where it pops up, like I need to go back soon because I'll just start to feel like there's areas where like a small patch is going to come back. Um, and again, like that, body hair and facial hair is so a part of everyone's journey um i have friends that are literally like the most stunning gorgeous women that i know that rock a full beard and they're loud and proud and they love it and they play with makeup and different colors in their beard and just make it their entire appearance and i think it's so cool and for the first time in my life, I was like almost kind of jealous for a minute that I didn't have this whole other canvas to work with. <laughs> and I think it's all unique to yourself. If you're trying to seek out laser hair removal, it is more beneficial if you have a bit of a lighter skin tone and a darker hair follicle because the laser can find the follicle a lot easier. If you're blonde, I've heard that it can be a lot more troubling and you may want to look into electrolysis instead because the laser won't execute against the follicles quite as well. 
Um, but again, it, it's a process. It's something that you have to be patient with um, and to each their own. Like if I could have been happier just like shaving my armpits and legs then I, I probably would have. But for me, I was like, I'm going to save myself like six months out of my life of shaving in a shower if I just laser these beasts off. <laughs> but um, I'll pass that off. Mm, so I have like such a weird feeling with like a lot of like body hair and facial hair. I actually only grow facial hair like here along my lips. Like I've never grown anything else. So I feel like I'm pretty blessed with that because I never wanted facial hair. And um, that was something that like scared me as a teenager. Cause I was like, oh hell no, I don't want to look like my dad. Like, no, thank you. Um, and I guess body hair for me is, I don't really care if I have body hair. Like it's, it's kind of just normal to me. I'm kind of just upset that I didn't inherit my mother's where she doesn't have any. Um, but I, I don't know my routine now with body hair is I just epilate it off. So I'm like, whenever I see it gets too unruly, I just like get rid of it. Um, and I don't know. I think it's as I've gotten older, I've been I'm more comfortable with kind of like just letting it sit there because we're human beings. Like we're gonna have hair; it's no big deal. And just quickly, laser hair removal is expensive, um, and this isn't a plug at all. I I was sponsored by a company called Tria Beauty, um, but they have like an an at home laser kit. Um, and I think the device is 500 bucks, which still it's not affordable, but it's a lot more affordable than paying for six sessions up front. And if it's something that you just want to start doing, like I felt more uncomfortable going in and getting it done and to be able to start doing the process kind of on your own, um, I find it really helpful. So obviously not TRIA, but there are at home laser devices. Um, some of them are. I think it's called IBF or something, and it's a light um, that targets the hair follicle. Um, and I heard they don't work as well, so try and find one that's an actual laser. But um, I think people are commenting with whatever the actual <laughs> thing is. But um, TRIA was something that helped me a lot because when they sent me the free device for doing collaboration with them, I didn't really expect much from it, to be honest. I kind of just thought, it was something that might be a bit of like a, a spa gimmick. Um, but I actually like in between sessions, especially when you're trying to save some money, it probably saved me like 10 to 12 sessions because I could just touch up areas that I needed spot treatments on. Um, and I can use it like anywhere on my body that I want to. So I don't have to go and get a full body treatment every time anymore. So just look at other at home places if you can't it's expensive if you can't afford it right now like don't feel like it's something you need to be saving up for and pressure there's ways around it and at home wax kits which are can be quite dangerous take my word for it do a couple tutorials and have a friend there to help you um but there's something that can be a bit of a money saver and still see great results with not on your face but on your body Thank you for sharing, everybody. We have time for one more question before we unfortunately have to wrap up. Uh, and I wanted to end this one on a very little like highlight slash positive note. Uh, so this is a question for everybody. Uh, what has been like the best year slash moment in your transition? What has been the best memory of your, your gender journey so far? Oh, sorry, I was stuck on mute. Um... Honestly, I would probably say this year, and I feel like a lot of people might say like the most current year, just because every year you see growth in yourself. Um, but I think this year I kind of came into my own with accepting how much I love being trans um, and how like proud I am to say that even though sometimes the world we grow up in can feel really dark and scary. My transness has allowed me to meet such incredible, amazing individuals. Um, and that's inspired me to really just be confident in who I am and not let so much of the outside world affect me. Um, and I also, I just found the way that I'm doing estrogen now, um, I'm doing estrogen injections 
instead of taking the estrogen tablets. And that this year has brought me a lot of happiness because I've just found some better personal results from it than I was on the tablet. Um, and as much as I hated the thought of a needle every week, it has slowly just become part of my routine. So I think coming into myself this year and feeling more confident in my body and in my transition, but also just feeling more confident in being trans in general and like embracing it and loving it for everything that it means to me um, really helped. And I think that that comes with time and hopefully next year I'll say I'm even more comfortable, but um, I think it's just, you have to get through that first process and like all of the uncomfortable moments to be able to look back and be like, okay, well, you know, I started there and for us as trans individuals, we kind of come into it with some odds stacked against us. Um, or at least we did when I was growing up, there wasn't any trans representation on TV. There was no trans conversations. Um, my counselor like never once brought up like, oh, you might be trans. You always identify with feminine characters and feminine roles. And it still was never something that was like picked up on. Um, so I think now that we have some more resources and we have more representation and we as trans people stand together louder and prouder, it's just like becoming a more beautiful place for us to all be a part of and embrace each other in. Whether or not the world is doing something different, we're doing it for each other. And I think that's what's really made me happy. So this year, I think I'm just grateful to be trans and grateful to be surrounded by other beautiful trans identifying people. I think for me, some of my happiest moments are when I'm in public and people see me or start to gender me one way and then take another look and, you know, decide to pause on deciding if they think I'm a binary man or woman. And so, you know, the moments that I'm out in public shopping or whatever, and people don't say, sir, or they say they use person or they refer to me as they, them, those feel really affirming. Um, even though I do use he, him pronouns, it's still, you know, it's just acknowledging to feel and see that. Um, I think another favorite moment is um, just, um, you know, I've been with my partner for over a decade and just their acceptance and willingness to grow and change with me has been really wonderful um, to the point where my partner has more Sephora points than I do because I get, you know, little, little gifts here and there, which is, you know, not going to say no to that. And it's very sweet and supportive, right? And so that just is, you know, I wasn't sure how it would go. And um, I, I feel fortunate and lucky that, you know, someone's down with a ride. So um, so when this question came up, I had like two particular moments where like, it just like hit me. Um, there was one when I was 17, I was like not dressed femme at all. I was with one of my old friends. We went, we went to my mom's place of work to eat and uh, I wasn't expecting someone to be like, excuse me, ma'am. And me and my friend just turned and looked at each other and we like started screaming. I was like, no way, no way, no way they call me ma'am. And like, I don't know, like that moment there I was like so happy because I was like wow someone finally sees me like how I want to be seen and then another one is a uh, same friend actually she, I think it was like five months into like hormone therapy she looks at me and she starts crying like bawling her eyes out and she's like you're not my old friend anymore like you're this new person like and she's like I see all of these changes in you and I like started crying too in the restaurant and I was like I don't know. It was just like such a euphoric moment because I was like, wow, I'm really coming into who I really want to be. And I always think of those moments whenever I start to doubt myself in my journey because I do doubt myself a lot. And now I'm just like, I don't know. The question was good. It just made me rethink of all of those moments. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing. I feel emotional just listening to all of that. I feel like these beautiful moments are just so they're so important to hold on to especially as trans people and going through all of our changes and evolutions as we will continue to do um 
that's going to be it for this community collaborative panel. Thank you so much for everybody who was in the chat, engaging, answering all of the questions and responding back to each other. It was so lovely to have a little bit of a community safe space for all of us. I also wanted to, you know, give a little acknowledgement of the fact that there were so many different questions that we weren't able to answer. And I also saw that there were a bunch of community, uh, sorry, a bunch of medical questions that we weren't able to answer too. So, we are actually on top of this community collaborative panel. On Thursday, we will be having our medical provider panel with our very own co-founder, Dr. Jerrica Kirkley. She will be leading the medical provider Q&A. So all of your medical questions around estrogen, HRT, gender transitions, et cetera, et cetera. That is going to be happening on Thursday, February 10th at 4 p.m. PT or 7 p.m. EST. You can find that in the chat, Alex had sent it out. And also just wanted to give a huge, huge shout out to our lovely community collaborators for being able to make this happen. Of course, again, Ray, Josh, Courtney, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram, TikTok, everything. Look through their profiles, look through all of their amazing content. These are amazing people. And yeah, super, super happy for you to be here. And we hope to see you on Thursday. And hope everybody has a good rest of your night. Yeah. Nice to meet care, you. Everybody.